Hello, and welcome to Please Don't Send Me Into Outer Space, the podcast intent on exploring all that science fiction and fantasy has to offer one movie at a time. My name is Joel. My name is Sarah. My name's Aaron. The movie this week is LXE. Is that what it was called on the uh, G. LXG? Oh, I LXG. Okay, <laughs> for, for gentlemen. I see. Uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen from two thousand three, <laughs> directed by Stephen Norrington, written uh, by uh, not by. You know what? We don't even need to talk about that. Uh, Alan Moore. Well, based on a comic book. Kevin O'Neill. Based on a comic book by, mm. by by these two gentlemen. And the farts heard in the bathroom. <laughs> Starring Sean Connery, Nasir Rudin Shah, Peter Wilson, Tony Curran. Oh, wait. Who cares about that guy? Tu- Stuart Townsend, Shane West, and Jason Fleming. Oh, I guess that's uh, the person I was like, who cares about that person? That was the Invisible Man. Well, you don't see him anyways, right? I, you can kind of make out his face, I guess, if that's what you what you want to do. Make out that Invisible Man's face. You get the idea, I suppose. Hey, how's it going? We're back to... Uh, hey, Joel. We skipped the last summer thing because we're just... It's too late. Summer's gone. <laughs> it's been destroyed. We just decided to do a fantasy or sci-fi jam. I mean, yeah. Get yeah. back get back to the normal paces and stuff like that. Sure thing. This was a group decision to do League of Extraordinary Gentlemen because we all had opinions before going into it. And uh, I have to say, after seeing that, I, I think I've changed my mind about how I felt. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, how did you guys feel before we watched it again? Because we'd all seen it before. Well, I can't recall if I read the book before seeing the movie, or if I saw the movie before reading the book, but I remember kind of thinking, like, after watching the movie, like, yeah, it was alright. That was my, my, my initial reaction of seeing it. There was some explosions. There was some special effects. There was some gunfire. It was alright. Right, and if they were on motorcycles and stuff, it would be totally okay... <laughs> to just have a bunch of explosions and stuff, but because it's the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, I feel like they could have used a little more finesse. Sarah, motorcycles weren't invented yet. This is uh, 1899. Oh, sorry. That's why, that's why there's a, a car present in the movie, right? That's why everybody sees that car, and they're like, what is that? And he's like, I call it the Automobile. And there's a, a cameo from uh, from Ford who's like, hmm, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> the first convertible. It wasn't convertible when they first got it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was definitely a uh, hoodless car. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought I thought it had like a roof in the beginning. Did it? Yeah. I, I think can't that, think so. I think that Tom Sawyer ripped it off. Like, oh. Uh, place there or something like that. How do you know that his first name is Tom? That's true. It could be... (laughs) (laughs) It could be Dom Dom Sawyer (laughs) or Dominic. So, you guys have both read the books. And I've read a little bit of the books. I think I've read the first one. But it was a long time ago and I don't remember that much of it. But I think that the book is a lot better. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, do you like reading stuff <laughs> with words? And the thing that is kind of annoying about it is that it is a story that I think should be it's entertaining enough to have been they could have done it possibly in a very different way than what they chose to do. 
I don't know. I think with the amount of resources they had, um, they could have they could have made a, a much closer adaptation, uh, and it would be just as entertaining, maybe even more. So, I have to say, some stylistic choices uh, made for this movie <laughs> were interesting, <laughs> to say the least. I mean, they made an action movie. Yeah. Out, of, out of a comic book that, like everyone said with Watchmen, uh, basically is kind of untranslatable in the film. Yeah. Now, I I don't think that they're the Watchmen movie. Uh, what was the name? Of, what's the name of that director? Did that Watchmen the DC stuff and stuff like that? Um, S- S- Snyder. Snyder. Yes, D. Snyder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with his Watchmen movie. I, I do think it, the book is obviously vastly superior, but that's not not really saying anything. I think it's hard to adapt any graphic novel, you know, all the way. And and Alan Moore's graphic novels are literature. They're literature. Yeah, I was gonna say making any literature into a good movie is hard, regardless of it being set in reality or in the past or what, but I feel like making a sci-fi world that someone has invented and that's also literature is like really a tall order. Just visually, what exists in The Watchmen versus the movie The Watchmen is so hard. Like, that is so... That's a... That's a rough pill to swallow. (laughs) Out out of... um most of Alan Moore's adaptations, that's my actual favorite. Yeah. The Watchmen. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a question I asked you earlier. Right? Yeah. Well, I didn't want to answer it while we're watching the movie, but yeah, mm-hmm. I have to say, out of all of them, that's my favorite. Well, I, I assumed you didn't want to answer because your answer was the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, so <laughs> I'm glad we cleared that up. <laughs> oh, man. I, and I think it's second place is V for Vendetta for me. Yeah. Because I felt that, that was... Uh, a pretty straightforward adaptation. There, you know, minor changes, you know, but overall, yeah. They, I, the only thing I remember, like, I didn't get all the way through V for Vendetta, uh-huh. but I could say that Natalie Portman's character in the comic is uh, like a dumb person. Yeah, like she's not, not, not like, like her. She's not that smart, right? And you know it comes off that way, so I think that was a positive change yeah, for the movie's no, sake. I, I really, I really like the movie a lot. I, that was actually a pretty fun movie going experience for me. Was V for Vendetta? Yeah. I, you know, the, the changes they made with Watchmen um, didn't like at the time when I saw it, I was upset. But uh, after watching it, at watching that movie again, I, I'm more leaning on that one because I feel that that Snyder was able to keep to the spirit of the work to the point where 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 some pretty major changes that a younger Aaron uh, was pretty upset about, not as important now. Now, this movie, on the other hand... Oh, this is a, this is almost a more perfect adaptation. They almost changed nothing from oh. the comic. Oh. I, I very, you know, that I appreciate. They, oh, yeah? But I Tell think me. that Tell might me. be the flaws. That's why this is not a good movie. Oh. They tried to trade... They, they tried to stay too true to the material. Okay. When you think of the... The character, um, what's his last name? Quartermain? Quartermain. I mean, you just get an image in your mind of Sean Connery as 007, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, uh, let's break from this reality. (laughs) Break from the reality we're creating. (laughs) If I really had to cast somebody as Alan Quartermain in some sort of film adaptation, I I would cast the late, great John Hurt. Who oh. was uh, he was in V for Vendetta as uh, yeah the oh yeah eyes or, ears or whatever it was John Hurt would have made a, an amazing uh, uh, Alan Quartermain yeah he's got the perfect like body type and yeah. an old man look about him like that's I think look like I think he would have definitely got the more troubled aged uh, Alan Quartermain that uh, Alan Moore, that was represented yeah. in the graphic novel yeah just an old man who wanted to be left alone after. The last thing that had happened. I had so much respect for his character in the books, even though I felt like there he was a flawed human being. I was like, wow, this is a person who I can empathize with or whatever. And like, 
in this movie, I'm sorry, Sean Connery, I do enjoy in a lot of different movies, but in this movie, I feel bad. It didn't. I did not feel anywhere near the emotion and the connection I did with that character in the book. Our, our introduction to him is is seeing him do great feats of superhuman strength and like pierce a man through a, a rhino horn on a wall. Like this is this is our introduction to this movie, guys. It's like I mean, first there's a decoy, Alan Quartermain, and then. There's Alan Quartermain, and then he takes an assailant and he he skewers him to a wall, like through pl- like metal body armor. It's it's pretty uncanny. Like this is what happened, guys. <laughs> the body armor is only on the front side of it. Oh, so oh. that's the, the oh. but no, but it pierces through though. Oh, it Even does that? go through. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been impaled by a rhino's horn, but. <laughs> I mean, I have it. Quite dangerous. <laughs> I, I haven't, Joel. That's mm. true. Mm. You know who would have been a great Alan Quartermain? The guy that he's like hiding behind the desk with is like, well, who had as our automatic weapons? And the guy's like, bloody unsporting, if you ask me. There, that guy could have been Quartermain. He's skinny. Yeah, yeah. I feel like he was. I know his character is a hero and was a hero, but I feel like he was also kind of an intellectual. Like in the book, you felt like you felt like he was somebody who knew some things, you know. Yeah, you could put yeah. things together. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, Sean Connery is putting things together left and right here because he's seen all and done all, and he's he's ready to, you know, even though he has rejected Queen and Country, he is ready to jump back in. So, honestly, Sean Connery is not my problem with the movie. Okay. I think. If I had to pick the worst parts, it's the added character additional things. I don't know what it is about Stuart Townsend. <laughs> oh. I don't know. <laughs> I, he's, he's a handsome man. People keep giving him roles, and he keeps, I don't know, <laughs> sticking him up his butt, and then the stuff comes out of his mouth onto the screen, and we're supposed to be like, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> he hasn't been in much lately. No, I, that's because he was exiled to the other side of the he earth. He had a hot minute there where he was in some stuff. Didn't he marry somebody? No, Third Eye Blind wrote some songs about Charlize Theron and, you know, because she used to go out with the singer. And then he, by way of dating Charlize Theron, became the subject of some songs. He became Third Eye Blind. <laughs> really? I'm guessing here, but. Wow. I, yeah. I didn't know that. That's um, that's, that's, a re- where that's he, a relevation. That's a re- yeah. It's relevatory. That's where he belongs. He belongs in the lyrics of songs, not starring in movies. <laughs> I don't. He doesn't. He's de- he doesn't have it. Whatever, oh, Joel, he wasn't was that bad in Queen of the Damned. Come on. <sighs> <laughs> this is the only movie since we watched Queen of the Damned, which unfortunately we didn't podcast about. But it's the first movie since then where Joel got up and walked out the door. <laughs> It was mid movie. <laughs> it, it was a moment. Well, I, I'm trying to remember what moment in the movie here drove me out. It well, was the Tom Sawyer. It was. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, after after the library battle, Tom Sawyer comes down. as like, uh, Agent Tom, Agent Sawyer, and I just was like, you know, what? I gotta go. I just, I just remembered. I, I left the, <laughs> I left a pie in the oven. Joel, you live here? No, no, the other oven. See you later. <laughs> That, was that was that a studio note? Like this movie doesn't have any American properties. Well, I got a feeling that if this was supposed to be the launching ship of like a trilogy, a, a whole entire you know new genre of film, the idea was that Alan Quartermain was then was 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 passing his torch to to a much younger uh, adventure that that he could relate to. Yeah, I mean that's that's probably what they were going for, but they they were also like, well, we can bring him back if we need to. Well, yeah, I mean that that is part of the comics, though. So, what other movies did it remind you of? Like as a movie experience, okay. what other movies did League of Extraordinary? It did remind me of Van Helsing, which is something you brought yeah. up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, being the whole vampire Dracula crossing over Frankenstein. You know, there's a, there's a part in this movie where 
they're walking across the ice and it's like, hey, there's Dr. Frankenstein. And they don't say that in the movie, but that's what we were joking about. It's like, that's a missed opportunity. I'm just saying, yeah, our, our edits of this movie would have been perfect. Yeah, like, like, well, the time period doesn't match up. Shut up. <laughs> he could have just been chilling on that on the ice. Mm-hmm. Who's to say, you know? This this is going to be extremely uncomplimentary, but it also kind of reminded me of the most recent, the Justice League movie. Uh, which I do like. I'm I'm one of those rare people that actually thinks it's a lot of fun. Oh, there's but some good moments in that movie for sure. But then there's lame. also some like my oh. my man moments. Any, you know? <laughs> no, that's great. What are you talking about, my man? <laughs> no, no. Any any Aquaman is good. It's cyborg where I'm just like, mm. okay, fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. yeah, no, Momo Momo eats eats up that movie. But, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. I can't wait for Aquaman the movie. If he doesn't say my man in that movie, though. Very disappointed. James Wan, we're talking to you. Get on it. <laughs> um, For me, it kind of reminded me of From Hell, the movie. Um, There you go. As opposed to the real life From Hell. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to the book by Alan Moore that was adapted to oh, a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Johnny um, Depp. Yeah. Um, and it kind of reminded me, I want to say of the first Captain America movie, even though I think the first Captain America movie is better, way better. I feel like they're trying to do all of this, tie in all of this like world war stuff and yeah. all of this international politics. And I mean, what yep. it, is it Hydra that they're... Yes. Like talking yeah. about, I mean, it almost seems like Hydra, the this, bad guy is in this. This phantom Definitely. fella totally trying to collect weapons of mass destruction to destroy people with. Right. Yeah. And you were saying it was kind of Hellboyish, the movie version. Yeah. Well, I feel, I feel that, that this time era, 2003, studios are scrambling. The, the, the comic book movie is a, is, a, is a new pioneering sort of idea, you know? Did like, you see how much those kids love the X-Mans? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> LXG, everybody, right there in the trailer for this movie. I, man, that was a moment. Uh, yeah. Like having the whole crew and then these bright green letters pop up. The guy said it. The guy L-X-G. said LXG. L-X-G. Yeah, nobody knew this movie as that. I don't no, know. Nobody I told it. me. Uh, like, excuse me, I've got a whole bunch of LXG merchandise. <laughs> Didn't you work in a comic book store when this happened? No, I did not. I did not. <laughs> that was that was, that happened a few years before my comic book store ten. Oh, okay. Oh. But yeah, I was thinking like Actually, volume two of of the comic book was coming out while the movie came out. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So they hadn't. He hadn't finished the story, which no. might explain why he didn't go. The, the same that would have been because that's one of the most interesting thing in, in volume two is where they decide to go with mm-hmm. the conclusion of the story. Like, yeah, uh, let's uh, like, we're going to spoil this movie, and we're also going to spoil some of the graphic novel. So I, I apologize in advance. Yeah, I don't want to go too much into details, but just ahead of time. We all probably recommend reading the Leave- yeah. League of Extraordinary. That's not what I thought Sarah was just going to say, and I was about to start crying. Were you, were you, did you think it was the opposite, Joel? No, I thought she was going to say, we're all going to recommend this movie. Oh. Why does your well, mind go to the negative? Because we don't usually you recommend don't trust me. We don't you don't usually. trust me. Hey, hey, stone cold. Okay? <laughs> we got a lot of repair to do to our relationship. Wow. <laughs> wow. No, uh, this, movie, this movie sucks, so don't watch it. Yeah, we don't recommend this movie, but I'm we're going to spoil like... some things from the book that were good. Yes. I, I recommend this movie if you're like... If Drunk. You're, if you're sick... Oh, sick! That's good. Uh, you know, you just need like a two-hour time span of where you're just like, I just want to chill. But I also recommend if you if you are in that sort of state to turn the volume down on your television because this movie suffers from uh, action movie. Uh, turn the volume up during action parts of the action movie. And dialogue super quiet. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, here's my recommendation. If you're one of those people that saw the latest Avengers, Avengers Infinity War, and went, that movie sucked, my recommendation is that you watch League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and then tell me how much Avengers <laughs> Infinity War sucked. <laughs> You're, you're telling me there are people who didn't like that movie? I mean, it, it's kind of a bummer fest in certain parts, but I mean, it's still a good movie. I I, right? just, I saw a whole thread recently really? that was a bunch of people being like, this movie wasn't good, and I don't know why people like it, and my opinion is important. Well, I mean, I I guess I guess I shouldn't be so surprised. No, comic, I mean, comic book nerds, you know. Yeah. Sometimes you got to kill them. Anyway, um... Or not. not so, totally. what happens in the the in this movie is yeah. uh, M, aka Moriarty, which is <gasps> revealed at the end of this movie, but is like at the middle point of the book. Yeah, and uh, he's not even like the main villain after the first volume, right? Yeah, no, nah, he he his exit from the graphic novel, the first graphic novel, is pretty awesome. It's uh, great. Yeah, yeah, pretty awesome exit, uh, and uh, would have been really fun to see in a movie. I yeah. would have liked that. There's certain, there are certain aspects I'm glad that they did not include. All, while I would have preferred uh, Quartermain to have been like a, maybe a kind of a opium addict or somebody. Who I would had have appreciated like more flawed or something like that. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't include Fu Manchu. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you that, that the, because the, we that's no longer a part of the culture. I agree with you. Yeah, I understand Alan Moore including in the graphic novel though because part of the time you know trying to use that literary references right. and stuff that adds like a layer of terror in the area that they're in that yeah. that, that like um i th- like is an interesting story story point and i don't think he directly calls out the person that we see as dr fu manchu no. it's just a, a scary looking uh the like asian wizard looking guy yeah who's doing a very scary thing in the book and it, it it's not an important part of the story other than it sets what's going on where we are kind of thing and that's that's the, the book is just like flavor after flavor exactly with, that happens to have a uh a plot yeah yeah it's kind of an unusual mashup but it feels like it works in the book and in this you're kind of like oh it's a mashup yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's a super smash brothers movies no way <laughs> <laughs> it's like a mashup of like Dracula and like. <laughs> what if Dracula and Frankenstein and the mummy and the creature from the Black Lagoon all got together? Hey, yeah, man. Wolfman then, has nards. Oh, no. But then what if Dr. <laughs> Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was there? Lame. And Captain Nemo. Yeah. And, yeah, no, I, I feel like. They knew the audience was not going to have, like, all the background lore, yeah. like, information. So I feel like they kind of dumbed it down. Absolutely. And they were just like, okay, well, here's a Dracula character, and here's a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde character, and here's a hero that looks like, you know, Indiana Jones's dad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did find it pretty funny in this movie that all these characters had to, like, give a brief paragraph about themselves at some, like, <laughs> Intr- re- relevatory, like, <laughs> moment. Except, except. Audience, if you haven't read my book before, this is what makes me special. <laughs> <laughs> except for Alan Quartermain. Except for him, who is... Treated as like, oh, of course, everyone knows who you are. You're the most important person, and kind of Captain Nemo too. But like, yeah. I mean, he's he's unique enough that it's like we, uh, you know, that's that's the one person where they were like, we know who he is. Let's let's just have him be cool, and that's that's cool. It's like, what's this? What's this Mina Harkis story? You know, yeah. what's, what's going on with that? I feel like. You could have just had the quarter main character, like, I personally was not familiar with those stories. Sure. And I feel like a lot of Americans may not have been, and it would have just been like some dude. He's an extraordinary person, but has nothing to do with the rest of these characters that came from novels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, But I, I think that... I mean, what do you think 
makes it less cheesy in the comic. Because I feel like that's the, that's it's the, the inter- issue. the inner group conflict that's occurring that I think really makes it more believable. The fact that Alan Quartermain doesn't like Nemo, doesn't mm-hmm. trust him. Uh, the fact that, I mean, and it is it is sexist, but the fact that Alan Quartermain doesn't trust Mina to be the leader of the crew, mm-hmm. I, it, it, I think it really kind of, it, it gives you like the era the time in which this story is supposed to be told and mm-hmm. all these characters existed. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that at once they realize there's a grand conspiracy going on, that they then can rely on each other as a group. And then just kind of like the chaotic manner in which the, the invisible man character is used in the first graph novel is brilliant. It's, it's really brilliant. And the movie, I feel like they, they do that a little bit of justice with the invisible man. Mm hmm. I just wish I just wish that uh, the Jekyll Hyde character had been. I mean, the effect, the effects, though very interesting, just uh, upon this viewing, just didn't really strike home for me at all. Um, I just wish they could have done him a little bit more justice. And then, of course, obviously, you know, the whole Tom Sawyer, Dorian Gray thing. Uh, I don't know, or maybe the whole fact that maybe I'm just starting to ramble now. But like uh, Miss Murray being a being a Dracula. Uh, <laughs> Listen, she's just not interesting unless she can do something. I mean, what is, she's a woman. She needs to be able to, to summon bats. I mean, think about her in the comic. Does she do a damn thing? No, she's just a woman. Well, I mean, that's like that's like the point is she doesn't need a power. She's a good detective. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> she's she's she doesn't need you know, like a like a Hulk strength, you she's, know? She's incredibly capable, yeah. and she's practically fearless, and she's very smart, yeah. and she's good at what she's doing, and, like, there's a reason why she basically becomes the leader of that, yeah. is because she has her head on straight, and she's not afraid to tell people to stop screwing around. There's a, a great part in the graphic novel when uh, Hyde is out and, like, grabs her and, like, yells in her face, and she's like, excuse me, I need you to unhand me, sir, or un- un- you know, let go of me. And Hyde, who has been previously just been killing people without anything, looks at her and, like, lets her go. And the way Kevin O'Neill draws her is, like, she obviously is afraid she's about to die, but that yeah. doesn't, doesn't stop her. And, like, he responds to that strength exactly. that she shows, like, oh, you actually took the time to say something to me like I'm a human being? Okay. And yeah. Exactly. It's not that you can't find this in that movie. Well, it it's just it's just the expected hero, like Alan Quartermain, who's supposed to be this great hero, can't do the job. You know what I mean? And it, it's just it's a great story. It's great that the and and I I feel that Miss Murray was definitely portrayed very interestingly and in a, in a way that that's really an entertaining read in the book. And I I I'm just so bummed that that it's like somebody. In the production, someone in the directing of this movie read that and they're like, nah. Let's give her some powers. Eh, let's make her just like a sexy vampire. You know what this is? That, movie is that cool needs. with you guys? Sexy vampire. Sexy vampire, yeah. I think they wanted to make it more sexy for sure. And I think that's why they had the younger guys in there because I think they didn't see any of the other men yeah. as like strong, like attractive leading men that exactly. they could like market or whatever. Uh, Sorry, Sean Connery. So in this scene, uh, Sean Connery and Mina have sex. What? What? Uh, no, we need another character in the movie. Stat anybody? And somebody? Somebody anybody? else has to have what's, sex with her. What's not that book not over the old there? man. <laughs> Let's get that Dorian Gray. Oh, right? the Dorian Gray's yeah. handsome. He's a handsome go. gentleman. Hey, that guy's right? done with that uh, that Queen of the Dam movie, right? Let's get him in. <laughs> Can we get one of them Musketeers? Uh, sir, that's the wrong type. Period. Uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised they. Sean Connery didn't insist on being the leading man, though. Yeah. You know? I mean, he's, he is the lead of the movie. I mean, yeah. Everything revolves around... But not the romantic lead. No, I mean, I think he could barely walk, so no, I don't know. I think at that point, he, he probably assumed he wasn't going to be. Yeah. Like, seeing the character go through the trials that he does in the graphic novel, and then just seeing Sean Connery just kind of, like, waltz his way through this movie like <laughs> like oh you know Aaron he lost his son I, uh well I mean 
Yeah, but like, but like he's still like, you know, but has he, some sympathy. But he gained a family. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's another another thing. Another thing from the book is that although some of the members of this gathered group, which they never go uh, with it. Oh, God, that part in the movie when M is like, ah, you're now part of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I just threw up. But anyways, in in the book, the members of this league are not, they don't really get along, but they do end up, you know, certain people do end up tolerating each other. Yeah. And like, there's, like like you were saying, Quartermain and, and Nemo kind of have an edge but they do have like agreements with each other and like i think there's even parts where they like joke with each other because they're like old people who existed in the time when all the colonial crap was going on and stuff like that and like uh you know things like that but it's not here in this in this they like you said it's like suicide squad they're a family now All my friends are heathens. Take it slow. <laughs> yeah, where was the song? That's what this movie was missing. You're right. I don't think I don't think there is a thematic uh, musical number for this movie. I think they wanted to make an action movie, and yeah. I think the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen can be an action story, but Absolutely. but it also had a lot of story that wasn't based on action. There you go. It wasn't like an action movie. Like, you know, how the comic books are, how comic books are. Like, they tried to make it like a superhero type thing. I, I see, I see the difficulty at hand though. Like, you're trying to make an action movie using literary characters, but like in such a way, what if someone doesn't know what these characters are? Like, I get that. Yeah. You know, and so maybe that's why everyone needed their like 15 minute paragraph of like, what makes them special? Yeah, we need to see, and and this movie yeah. is like an emphasis on the fact that they're special, and that because that's part of the bad guys' right. plan. And we right. get a little skin cell from an Invisible Man. We get a little blood from Vampire Lady. We get a boat from the one non-white actor, uh, and an old man who's here. If you put a little patch of skin on your skin. It will turn the same as the little patch that you put on. No way. <laughs> what are you referring to? Was that a science thing that happened in this movie? No, I don't know how they were saying, like, okay, now we can make us all invisible men with oh, a patch yeah. of skin. Yeah. Well, they like uh, they took his DNA and they, they detranslated it through the 1989 DNA analyzer machine. And, and then... Uh, 18... 18... 1899. <laughs> Before World War I was even a thought in somebody's mind. Hey, spe- oh, speaking of things that happen in the movie that don't happen again whatsoever, uh, there's a battle tank in the very beginning. Oh, yeah. And there's just no sign of that tank later. Well, there. Very briefly, when we get to the big bad guys, An- Antarctica base or his North Pole base, uh, snowy base you know his e- snowy sex dungeon evil yes. evil evil phantom destro oh phantom whatever his name is the phantom of the opera is kind of oh, this guy oh that's right he does kind of have a phantom of the opera the steampunk thing going on phantom uh metal oh he's the phantom of the park rob zombie oh phantom of the <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> That's the other movie that made me run out. Oh, was that, was that in Queen of the Damned? There, there is a a great scene in Queen of the Damned to spoil it, where two actors are talking to each other, uh-huh. and then it immediately transitions to ooh, wah, and it's like cars going through the desert. It's a tra- oh. The song is used as the transition cut. Oh, beautiful. I knew. I knew them. I knew that movie. When that happened, we had to pause it because I was crying. I was crying from laughing so hard. Makes me so happy. I got to see that movie again. Now we got to watch for the podcast. Oh, it makes me happy. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, the Antarctica base. Yeah, well Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the tanks. There there's a scene where 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 we're getting like the the lowdown on oh, when on, we're on like 
flying through the thing. Yeah, yeah, you see, you see, like, these Iron Men costumes, and then right next to it, there were, like, five mm -hmm. of those tanks. Yeah, Tony Stark built that in a cave, by the way. I heard. But it was, like, almost a hundred years, more than a hundred years in the future. Mm. Yeah, so. Tony... <laughs> Tony Stark's grandfather. <laughs> it had to be his great great grandfather, possibly. <laughs> too good, too good. But yeah, there were like five tanks, but I mean, it was like real quick. Like, like if you didn't like notice, like, like if you didn't blink, you'd miss him. Well, it was the part when it was like the scientists are kept alive, the women and children are all dead, and then Nemo's like that monster or something like yeah, that. about about that point. Yeah. It was kind of like right before the part where Sean Connery had to have his like little stare into the white tiger's eyes. Oh yes. Why didn't we have a movie with Sean Connery staring into tiger's eyes more? <laughs> I think that would have been a more entertaining movie for me. It's, yeah, it could have been like a re that, at the very least it could have been a reoccurring thing. Like he kept seeing a tiger, like in the alley in the cool. dark, you could see like the tiger's eyes flashing or something like that. Or, a relevant, uh, yeah, sort of reveal to him. But we didn't make this movie. Otherwise, it would have, uh, to spoil volume two, it would have had Martians in it, for God's sake. Yeah, that would have made a more fun movie. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, oh, I was gonna say, getting back to the tank thing, I think that opening scene was like an afterthought. Because, like, I think they were like, oh, it'd be too slow if we, like, went and tracked down somebody in Africa first thing in this movie. So let's have some big, like, action thing in the opening that has nothing to do with anything else. Yeah. We'll just tie the rest of the movie together to it at some point. Uh, look, the newspaper article says Germans say, we didn't do it. <laughs> Yeah, that made me laugh pretty hard, too, when I saw that newspaper article. I thought... Not as good. Not as good as the newspaper articles in uh, in Stone Cold, of course, but... Oh, yeah, that's true. Go they down had in some history. good writers for that. <laughs> but Germans say we didn't do it was pretty good. Um, that made me laugh. <laughs> German says it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> She's been a photo with a man just in leader hose and two. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> that first scene looked really low quality to me, like low budget. Yeah. The tank looked like it had like cardboard on the sides of it to me. And then when they bro broke through that wall, it had like wood. I mean, when you think about it, though, <clears throat> in 1899, cardboard was very strong, probably, you know, it had just been invented. It was a very strong material for mm. back then. You could run over a man with cardboard. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, the buildings were all made out of papier mache. That's true. Or papier mache, as they say in, in France, I assume. We went to France in this movie. We went to Paris for a moment. And Venice, too. We went to Venice. And when you think about that scene in the book, not the Venice scene, because guess what? That doesn't exist. Yeah. You think about the Paris scene. Okay. And the way that's that's drawn out, you know, with uh, Quartermain and and Mina uh, are going to seek out uh, this killer ape, you know, for some reason that they they've heard about, and uh, you know, of course, it turns out to be Hyde, and done in such a completely different way with all these characters that they didn't want to introduce, you know, like of all of all the random characters in the book that they picked out. To be like just a spot character in this, it's like uh, Ishmael, because people know who that is, right? That's right. Like Ishmael, if, yeah. If, if anyone's read Moby, any part of Moby Dick, they've read the first part of Moby Dick. Call, Call me, me Ishmael. Ishmael. Boring. Throw it out. Of the <laughs> 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 the, they could have been riding around. In a in a white whale named Moby Dick. Yeah, like it could have been. <laughs> that could have been another tie-in. He could have been a, a member of the league. Yeah. Get yeah. rid of Dorian Gray. We're bring gonna in Moby throw Dick. a wheel. We're gonna <laughs> throw a whale at him. <laughs> You'd never see it coming. Well, Moriarty, you didn't think I would have a killer whale, did you? <laughs> well, you're right. I've got a regular whale. Whatever he is. Anyways, you're dead. Yeah, I gotta say on further further reflection, 
uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen has a lot of obscure references, like exactly. as as a book. Oh, I mean, tons of obscure references. Like, h- how is that going to relate to a movie? Like, I don't. I, there's no, no way. No, no, no. That's, there's no way. That's you know? what I was saying. Like, if the, what they should have done, in my opinion, is taken League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, just the concept. Sure. And move it over to TV shows or movies. Oh, yeah. Like, take characters from movies or TV shows that whatever company published this movie had the rights to. Beautiful. And throw them together and, and, like, call it the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And they, they maybe, they could even reference the literary side yeah. of it or something like that. But it would have been, like, this, like, fun take on the thing. But, uh, you know, of course, nobody was going to go that far creativity One of One of my favorite parts of the uh, graphic novels are the uh, giant paintings found in the League's uh, library, kind oh, of yeah. detailing earlier versions of the League. Well, they had those. Uh, yeah. No, very briefly, you saw them. I just wish we could have lingered on them just a little bit more, because it looked like it. It they looked awesome from from even just the brief couple seconds we saw of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm so sorry. I, I can't remember the name of the artist, uh, but they're- Kevin O'Neill. Oh, no, no. I know Kevin O'Neill did the art for the book, but oh. there was another artist recently who had taken upon himself to do exactly what you just mentioned, Joel, which is take characters from particular eras of action movies and TV shows and make their uh, basically his uh, their own version of A League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And I remember like the, the 90s one had like Zack from Saved by the Bell. Nice. And... Uh, uh, if I ever, uh, I mean, he can freeze time. That's I what I'm saying. He'd be a very important part of. of <laughs> it was pretty mm. cool. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what they're doing with the Marvel movies, right? Those are the new League of Extraordinary. Right. Those are all Marvel characters, so that's not. Yeah, they're called the Avengers or something. Yeah, or the <laughs> Defenders, right? The Defenders is a much better name. I think so because you wouldn't. I mean, avenging well, means that something's already happened, right? Well, I mean, you can't just like go out and avenge, like. Well, some- <laughs> weren't they avenging Agent Coulson or something? I mean, the, the, I think it's a, that's a terrible line from the first movie when Tony, <laughs> Tony, Tony Stark is like, "We we may not be able to defend them, but we sure as hell will avenge them," or something something yeah. very similar to that. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's heavy. But uh, you know, I guess you gotta. You're going to have a line for that uh, trailer, don't you? I agree with you, though, that the the Defenders sounds like a better superhero team. Right, because that's what they're doing, right? They're defending. (laughs) If I were to pretend that I don't know the graphic novel that this is based on. Yes. And I were to just watch it as an action movie, which I probably did. I probably hadn't read it at the time that I saw this movie. Um... I think it has a few problems anyway, and I not to diss the movie too much because it is it is okay for a for an action movie compared to some things that we've watched. It's more entertaining than like than a lot of movies I've seen have been. Just all of a sudden I thought of that movie with Angelina Jolie and the loom that like Gives you wanted, yeah. <laughs> another another adaptation. Bend those bullets, guys. Hey, kill one, save a million. That's that's <laughs> actually what the comic was. The comic is edge lord kind of crap, but it's way more interesting than what that movie was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just thought of that all of a sudden. Um, but yeah, if I didn't have any frame of reference for this movie, I probably would be less critical of it. But knowing how good the source material was, I mean, it's not the best graphic novel that... It's not my... Uh, okay, take that out. Edit that. It's not my favorite graphic novel that I've ever read. But it's an up there graphic novel in terms of ones that people would probably say if you're going to read graphic novels these are the ones you need to read in your life like Watchmen and yeah yeah and, Alan Moore has a couple yeah on yeah list. yeah absolutely but on its own I think there are a couple issues with the plot I think just like it gets a little meandering in a couple places and it is action packed it is pretty action packed 
but the whole Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde character was so disgusting to me that I did not want to see him. His giant fleshy body. It's even worse when that other version, you know, the guy who drinks too much potion comes Yeah. Out. It's like purposely disgusting and you have to see, you have to see so much of him, like. In order to see their fight and what happens, you have to watch these gross things on the screen against each other. And I didn't, I didn't completely pay attention to it this time because I saw it all the first time and I was grossed out by it then. Um, yeah, pulsating flesh bulbs, that's good. I was saying it reminded me of those uh, mutated chicken breasts that we saw destroyed in Death Laid an Egg <laughs> episode. Shout out to Spencer Seams from the Death Laid an Egg episode. Yeah, thanks, Spencer. For yeah, the, thanks for ruining our life. For the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, are you researching? Oh, no, I was just fine. I, Trying to find that artist? Yeah, I can't find it, but here is a very small uh, image of the 1988 team um, right, right there. So, yeah. So we got Mr. T, Big Trouble in Little China... Jack Burton. Uh, Jack Doc, Doc Brown, Doc I Brown believe. Brown the center. And Flashdance? I think so. Okay. Well, I mean beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> I don't I don't know what Flashdance is power. I've never seen that movie, so I'm not sure what her power is. You know who they should have is uh, Dalton from uh uh Oh crap. What's the bouncer? What's the movie where he's a famous bouncer? Are you talking about Patrick um, Swayze? Roadhouse. Roadhouse, yeah. Yeah. That'd have been a good choice. Rule number one of the league: be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could remember the name of the artist, though. Uh, I feel bad. Well, write in today, artist, if you know your name. And I apologize if any, but if this was like anybody's favorite movie, like, or they really loved it, or they think we said something out of turn, I apologize. I'm not trying to offend anybody on this podcast. We're just talking about. I, uh, How we felt. <laughs> I know for a fact that my dad is like a huge fan of the movie. He hasn't. I don't think he's read the books though. Oh, okay. But he enjoys it for the steampunk element. Oh, well, sure. Right. Of the movie. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I've seen people that like this movie. And, and stuff out of like context that. from the book, it is you know, it, it, it's an entertaining, crazy explosion fest, you know, movie. Out of context from the books, I still think it sucks. It sucks. It sucks. It sucks. It's just like it's got a bad story. Oh, yeah. And like irritating dialogue, so many like oh, one-liners absolutely. and quips and garbage, and the uh, the effects do not stand up. You, it, it's kind of hard to follow. Like, why the did they the, go here? The boat, the boat effects I thought were okay, but no, they, Mr. Yes. Mr. Hyde definitely he was yeah, a bit rough running through the city and stuff like that. That's I mean it was okay, but I don't like. I remember when I seen saw this in the theater. I hadn't read the books, mm. and I didn't. I thought it was a crappy movie. <laughs> I, I don't want to. I don't want to seem sued. Period. This was but I always thought it was lame. This is before you even like really raised your standards. Yeah, I didn't even know what a book was. I was like, mm. no. I mean, you Time hadn't like taken film classes. Yeah, exactly. Yet. I was like, yeah. I was like, oh man, this is this is worse than Dracula two thousand, and that was a bad movie. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I, the high standards I have now, <laughs> except for I, I like a lot of crap too. So. It doesn't even work as a crappy movie. I don't know. Maybe in some circles it would. <laughs> I mean, watchability, I had only seen this probably once before. And this is like, you know, 14 year to 13, 12 years later. I don't know when I saw this on DVD. But um, it was made 15 years ago. <laughs> and I didn't see it in the theater. I, I'm pretty sure I did not see it in the theater. But, um, but yeah, I feel like the, I didn't really forget that much of what happened in the movie and I didn't really feel like I had, yeah, misremembered it or given it upon second viewing. It was pretty much the same as I'd remembered it being and, yeah, and not something I felt like I'd been dying to see again. Yeah. So Agreed. once might be enough. I just found the, the 1996 iteration of the team. Did you find the artist? No, but I found his work again. Uh, originally, it was published through uh, Comics Alliance, which was a pretty fun website. I well, don't know if it's still cool. up and going. I used to be a big fan of the Comics Alliance website, though. 
This is Devinder Brar, Chris Bird, and Andrew Wheeler. So one of those is probably the artist, okay. I assume. Cool. Who, who's on the 986 uh, raster? Uh, we got Chow Yun Fat from... Um, Hard Boiled, I believe. Yes, Hard Boiled. Got one of them girls from The Craft. Okay. Edward Scissorhands. Yeah. Zach Morris, of course. Yep. D- Dana Scully. And Rufus from Back to the Future. Oh, wait. Uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Rufus. I like these pictures in the background, too. We got uh, we got Egon Spangler. We got uh, whatever that uh, one anime character with the uh, green hair and the tiger print dress thing. You know what I'm talking about? Lum? Yes. It looks like Lum. Teen cool. Wolf. Um, oh, man. I can't remember that guy's name. Carmen San Diego, <laughs> Tron, and Max Headroom and Highlander. Nice. Yeah, we got all our bases covered. Anywho, about this movie, <laughs> I mean, is there is there anything else to, to say much about it? Like, uh, like, do you guys actually have a scene that you you were thinking is is good about it? I mean, no. My favorite parts of this movie took place on the ship. I felt like that set design was more interesting for me than a lot of the other ones were. That may sound, I don't know, it resonated with me more as like a potential like mythical space that they created that looked like it could be, you know, I don't think it was as, it looked as old as it would have looked then, but it looked, you know, vintage for sure. I don't know if it was, I don't know what era it was supposed to be in, Edwardian or Victorian, but I think, um, yeah, the the stuff with Captain Nemo, his, okay, costumes, I'm just going to do that for a minute. Sure. I didn't have much of a problem with the costumes in this movie, although I feel like Sean Connery's, I get it, it was like an adventurer costume, but- yeah. I think his was probably the least impressive out of anybody's, but I liked the Captain Nemo costume. I liked Mia's, Mina's, sorry. Um, I liked the Dorian Gray one. I liked, huh, I don't even want to say Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Invisible Man with his- uh, Oh yeah, the Invisible Man was cool. That yeah. was really cool design. It's a man with a trench coat and nothing else. Yeah, I was like, so are you just a nudist if you turn invisible? I mean, you gotta be, right? Because <laughs> you can't use it otherwise. I, I'm just interested in how, like, there are moments when he's, like, totally abandons the league in this movie, and then he comes back, and in the next scene after that, his face is fully painted again. Like, everyone's just like, yeah, we know he's gonna show up again, so we might as well bring this with him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's that scene in the fight in the library where you see him, like, throw off his coat and, like, take the paint off so he can, yeah. like, help with the fight. And then immediately after the fight, he's got his paint back, like, like fully wait, painted, wait a minute. fully painted. <laughs> he's like, uh, 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 just in case. I feel like they were like each day somebody was going into his little cabin, his room, and like putting out a new outfit for him just in case he was around. Because like they had one of those snow coats for him That's too. True. When they showed him, they had the white paint on his face and they had the snow coat. And I was like, they must have been bringing it along and like prepared for him just in case. They they kept putting out clothes, hoping he would put on clothes. For God's <laughs> sake! Like I know you're invisible, but we also know you're naked. Put clothes on. I remember in the comics, he used to wear like he would like sit in like a smoking jacket with like a little fez and like yeah, and, and, you know, just... like the Invisible Man in the in yeah. the movie, yeah, mm-hmm. right? you precisely know, looking dignified or or whatever. But it's a good thing they didn't go with his characterization from yeah. the comic books because that's that guy's a, a disgusting, gross person. And well, uh, I mean, yeah. they're, they're, that's the purpose of the character. Exactly. He's supposed to be chaotic. Or, that's true, you know. But in this, he's a gentleman thief. I think they kind of made him kind of Rorschachy too. I I honestly think that that the actor may be the same actor who played Rorschach. Oh let, no! Let, it's me, not. let me let me check. It's that. not. It's, definitely it's not. not. Okay. That guy has a very specific look. Yeah, he's got a face. Um, <laughs> I don't think that he's written like Rorschach. I think that 
the costume design for Rorschach in the Watchmen movie is kind of similar to the costume design they did for this character. Yeah, trench coat. Yeah. That kind of stuff like that. And the white face, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can see that. The kind of a similar design going on there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't really, I, I got nothing, I got nothing <laughs> I, else. Yeah. My, my energy has been spent. Oh, I'm sorry, Joel. No, it's okay. Like, I, I told you, we got to go along, because eventually I think we would have to talk about this movie. We might as well start off getting back into sci-fi and fantasy with a, you know, a, a kickstart of clicking our heels together and <laughs> happiness and joy. <laughs> I feel like this was a bad era. For these types of movies. Yes. They were getting their footing, but it felt like, I mean, like Queen of the Damned and like Dracula 2000 was a few years earlier and like, oh. Even stuff like the Matrix Revolutions. Yeah. It's like, throw everything into a pot, throw throw money at it and let everything stick to the wall. And- Whatever's on trend right now gets to be part of it too. Like. Yep. Like every once in a while, you'll get you'll get a X two, and it's like okay, the X Men is still working. That's fine. Uh, what what else have we got? Uh, Blade two. Oh well, that worked out for some reason. Like okay, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Comic books must be the thing, and then you know the rest of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, best movie you've ever seen? Uh, no. Oh, okay. What about uh? What about like uh after? Volume one and two, Black Dossier and Century. How do you feel about those comics? Uh, well, I mean, I feel that both Volume one and Volume two, and Black Dossier definitely, uh, I I feel are very in sync. But I feel that uh, uh, much later in the series, the the, vo- the overall voice of uh, what Alan Moore is trying to explore uh, changes. And I mean, I feel that there are a few comics in the later end of the league series that are just done to be very exploitive or just like he no longer has to follow any particular type of rule. And so he just kind of does certain things to be very suggest suggestive or even just, you know, con- controversial and shocking for shock's sake. Yeah. That and it sucks. Kind of loses the overall feel of the series in my opinion. Uh, I mean, I might be wrong. There's a new one that just came out. I haven't read it yet. Really? Uh, there's just. A I n- thought he was done. No, oh, that's well, what this is supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, f- this will be the final league book. That I just, see. It just started. Uh, I want to say about a month ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but I, I, I feel that it was uh, one of Captain Nemo's daughter stories that that kind of. And I, I get it. I get the point that he was trying to make, but it was just very unnecessary, in my opinion. Well, you have to tell me about that when yeah. we're done with the podcast. Sure. Does it have the hunchback of Notre Dame? No, just kidding. Long time <laughs> period. Can't have it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Sarah? I look. I looked up a list of graphic novels that you must read. Oh. And uh, From Hell was on there. Watchmen was on there. I didn't see this one. I have From Hell, and I just haven't mustered the effort that I need to get it. Like, I, I feel like an Alan, any Alan Moore work is... You, you're going to be in it, like, for the long oh, yeah. haul kind of thing. Like, none of his stuff is short, like, the the more important things. I think I have V for Vendetta and From Hell, and it's both, the, like, I've gotten into part of them. It's just, like... Neither of them are going to be lighthearted, you know? Like... Uh, yeah, that's not what I mean. Yeah. But it's, like, it's thick text. Yeah, it's dense. Yeah. It's, like, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite comics of all time is The Adventures of Luther Arkwright. Oh, yeah. And that is thick text. But oh, yeah. It's like the art is great, and the story goes into places that, like, it's it's imperceivable. But, like, one of my other favorite, like, writers is, is Warren Ellis, and, like, uh, I love uh, Ch- Transmetropolitan. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, Planetary. And Planetary does something very similar, where they they take a bunch of pulp ideas, and they kind of... They, you know, just to the left of, you know, like they have uh, references to um, actually to there's a whole section of like vertigo properties that they just slightly to the left of it. Yeah. It's not actually referencing John Constantine or right. Tain, but, you know, stuff like that. And then there's a like a 
island where they discover where there's giant kaiju monsters. But nobody says Godzilla because it's not Godzilla. It's kind of just to the left of it, you In- know. Interesting enough, though, about Planetary Joel. Mm. They do bring up the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Really? In Planetary. Well, I know they, they basically have a knockoff version of them with uh, the people that are like... Um, Oh, no, no, there's a stray reference. Uh, uh, I mean, to spo- should I spoil Planetary on this? I don't know. Let's not do that. All right. <laughs> Anyways, I, say- I, I think Warren Ellis does some it's complicated great, though. stuff. It's great, But compared to Alan Moore, you know, it's it's Dr. Seuss yeah. to whatever. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's great. Uh, I, I love them both. It doesn't matter. I f- yeah, I feel like... Maybe we should recommend some comic books. I know we're <laughs> wrapping it up here, but... Go read Planetary. Yeah, it's good. Warren Ellis. Mouse is good. Persepolis is good. Yeah. I... Yeah, it's a completely different tone than the, the kind of stuff we have been talking about, but obviously like, uh, you have to read that stuff. I think they're great to read, though. Absolutely. Just as important as reading Watchmen, in my opinion. I mean, Mouse and Persepolis are, they like, I feel they're like... history. They're, yes, yeah. It's like an important, eye-opening look at uh, history sources that you wouldn't get otherwise. Yeah. And, um, I mean, set in reality, I really like shortcomings. I mean, I really liked Strangers in Paradise when you first sent it to me. I got really into that when I first read it. Yeah. I mean, that's very soap operatic. Yeah. That one's more of like a... A fun time soap opera type read. It gets dark though, but it you know it goes up, down, left, right. It's good. Yeah, maybe not on the same scale, but I would definitely recommend maybe some some Brian K. Vaughn. But I mean that's more fantasy. We're talking but, Why the Last Man. Yeah, Saga. Yeah, Paper Girls Saga. Oh it's yeah, I just good got stuff. the Paper Girls. All about that Paper saga. Girl. Saga's good. And uh, what was I just thinking of? Oh, mashup. Fables. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, Sarah. Fables is so good. And like the entire run is good. You know, every once in a while there's like an entire huge run. Like obviously, uh if you're watching TV, Preacher, the books, they're they're kind of once again, <laughs> a leaning towards the whole Edgelord thing where it's like, uh, we're shocking to be shocking, but that's Garth Ennis for you. And I think that Preacher is still a very good read. Yeah. I, I had a good time reading it. I don't know if I'd ever go back, but no. <laughs> for 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 a one time read, I thought it was pretty good. I usually like Craig Thompson stuff too. I'm trying to think of what else I'm really what are I, some um, of my faves. I probably read it too often, but I'm a big fan of the the Sandman run too. Oh Neil yeah. Gaiman's Sandman's pretty uh Oh my god. Pretty, uh, pretty up there for me anyways. Uh And the art's so like fantastical. I really love the fact that he uses so many different artists to get the different tone of what he wants, and it's good. I really like Neil Gaiman's imagination, just about, like, the way yeah. he can kind of spin a story is really interesting. It's another thing they're uh, ad- adapting soon is uh, Good Omens with, uh, with that he did with Terry Pratchett. Oh, Terry Pratchett, yeah. Mm, and, of course, there's uh, American Gods. American Gods you, mashup. If you haven't read that book... <laughs> You should just read that book. You can, if you're an average reader, you can probably read it in a day or two. If you're like me, uh, it'll take a month. But no, oh, Matt's great. <laughs> I'm just a really slow reader. I can't help it. How's the show hold up? I haven't seen the show yet. I hated it, but I'm just too. I'm too close, close to, to the material. material. I can't help it. It's probably a very good. Sh- Sarah, what's your opinion? I mean, I think it's an okay show, but I think that they they went in a lot of different directions real quick just Got to it. like introduce you to all these ideas and I think maybe later shows of it would be they could potentially be better, they could potentially be worse yeah. depending on if they try to rein it in and give it more depth or if they try to go in more directions. Yeah, I don't think, I just don't, maybe it should have been a miniseries, like, they could have done it probably all in, you know, 12 episodes, or maybe the last season of Twin Peaks leaked the stuff, it doesn't need to be a ongoing show the way it is, but, I mean, that, like I said, I'm I'm just way too close yeah. to the to, Yeah. Like, uh, like, if they, had, maybe if they adapt uh, a Nancy Boys, I'll, I'll feel better, I don't, I don't know, anyways... <laughs> 
Just some recommendations. Oh, yeah, the Hernandez brothers. Um, Palomar. Some Love and Rockets. Yeah, I love Love and Rockets. That stuff is so poppery, too. They're a bit too sexy, if you ask me. Yeah, that one's kind of... But I also think that, like, the way... Oh, and Daniel... Cla- Duh, Daniel Klaus is, like, my favorite nice Who's that writer guy? of characters. Like, the way he writes people is, like, he freaking absorbs them in the coffee shop or something. So which, <laughs> which Daniel Klaus would you specifically recommend? I mean, I love Ghost World, but... But all of his books are really weird. I I kind of like the weird stuff. Yeah, I think Daniel Boring is David David, or David Boring. Boring. Sorry, David Boring is so weird and kind of creepy, but at the same time, like really engrossing and like hard to put down. Was wasn't Klaus's work adapted into a movie recently? And I mean, I know, I know that oh, Wilson. Wilson. Oh my yeah. God, Wilson is yeah. I recommend that movie, by the way, because Woody Harrelson. I mean, I don't, I don't know how good I would say it is at being close to the book exactly, yeah. but they, Woody Harrelson is so funny in it, just being as annoying as a Daniel Klaus written character is. <laughs> um, it's got Laura Dern in it too. You can't go wrong. I thought that was a pretty great movie. I haven't read the the comic. But I did enjoy the movie quite a bit. Wilson? Yeah. I haven't read the book yet. Oh. I didn't know you saw the movie. I did? Well. Yeah. Wilson's fine. good. The Death Ray's okay, good. I have Our all of his stuff. I recommend Daniel Klaus stuff. But he can be really gross sometimes, too. Well, yeah. I mean, that's his thing. Just like humans. Humans can be really gross. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the plug here. Enough of this stuff. Uh, nobody recommends *Leave the Story of a Gentleman* the movie, but unless you're <laughs> you like inebriated or if you uh, haven't seen it and sick. you're dying to see it, go ahead and watch it. Oh, that's my advice yeah. on anything. <laughs> like, just because we don't like a movie and we don't recommend it, doesn't mean you need to stop yourself from seeing it. Nobody's going to think less of you if you like *League of Extraordinary Gentlemen*. I would not do that. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm going to read this outro stuff. You guys think of a lesson you learned from the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, <laughs> a.k.a. Oh. LXG. LXG. Hey there, listeners. If you want to leave us a uh, star written rating, I'm just going to get this out of the way first. But uh, yeah, you can leave that on iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts. We love you. We We don't want to hurt you. I'm just telling you this right now. <laughs> <laughs> You know what's a better idea? Write in, a, write in an angry email to us at please don't podcast at gmail.com or message us on Facebook, facebook.com slash PDSMIOS. And uh, if you uh, are interested in some more uh, uh, podcasts that are like ours, which you probably wouldn't be because we just made a statement that <laughs> might upset you, uh, check out our other podcast at yourtrumpetaudio.com. <laughs> Are we I gotta, going off the rails here? I gotta hop in this escape pod as quick as I can. <laughs> can. Can we get some lessons from the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, A please? Okay. I I'm just gonna spout my lesson real quick. Go for it, Joel. If at a certain point in the movie you introduce a giant top hat, I want to see that in the rest of the movie. Don't just have a character pick it up randomly and look at it weird. You got to bring that sucker back in. I kind of wish he'd thrown it at somebody or something. Or later he was just like had it in his room and like when no one was watching, he like put it on and like Mina caught him. It was like, What are you doing? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Tom Sawyer. That would have been great. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you have if it's the Victorian era and like you have the technology of the car the automobile, I guess share that idea with people, maybe. At the very least, you could market it and make some money. Yeah. I mean, everyone should just be driving Nemos now, right? Oh, yeah. The Ford Nemo. <laughs> the Ford Nemo? The Nemo Ford? I don't know. Oh, my gosh. I just realized that at the bank part in the beginning, they stole Leonardo da Vinci's drawings? Yeah. Of Venice, yeah. I believe. Because I'm like... 
Okay, these sketches by Leonardo da Vinci weren't just available on the internet back then. They couldn't have just, like, looked yep. them up. They needed to acquire them. So that's why in the beginning they did Right, okay. But how did they end up with them? Oh, uh, Nemo says these are copies. Oh, because they, ma- they had copy machines. Yes. <laughs> I call this the photocopier. (laughs) Well, they could have traced it on parchment with a candle or something, but yeah. um, I mean, they had photos back then, so. Well, yeah, but they were light sensitive. Like, yeah. Um, (laughs) I'm going to say my lesson from this movie is if somebody is trying to get you to join a gang... You should probably wait and think it over for a while. (laughs) Try to find out more about them. Try to find out more about the person who's asking you to do this. I know sometimes you gotta fight the good fight, but uh, find out which side of it you're on, maybe. I like that, Sarah. That's that's perfect. Uh, I have one more lesson. Please. My lesson is um, if you're getting chased by a famous... uh, Hunter and um, a, a boy from the South who's become a special agent. And uh, I, my lesson is, is be sure to like totally have like some type of uh, flying cloak underneath your, <laughs> your giant uh, fur coat thing. How, how did he get away from that? I don't understand. Like, Sarah, you explained that he had, like, a, a Da Vinci's uh, a glider underneath <laughs> yeah. his, on his coat? No, I think I made a joke about Bat- yeah, Batman. The, oh, Batman. The wonderful is- toys. <laughs> <laughs> like, all I know is he was, like, at least 300 feet in the, in the he air. He was up there. Yeah. And then suddenly he was okay on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, he just jumped, and he had he had something on his arms that just looked like a regular cape. Well, maybe he used some Amina Harker's blood, and he had bats that coming out of his armpits. Oh yeah, I it was, was, one, I was wondering was where she was keeping those. one one big bat. <laughs> <laughs> I like that visual though. The idea of that a vampire could keep bats in their armpits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I gotta keep them warm somehow. That's good, Joel. Mm-hmm. My my last lesson is uh. When you look into the eyes of a tiger, you need to think about your own existence. Be careful. I think the 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 actual tiger that I mean my my version of that tiger lesson is that when you look into the eyes of a tiger, all you can ever see is love, even if it's mauling you to death. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Aww. Well, yeah, we have a cat named Tiger, and it's a very dangerous animal. Oh, also the tiger in the movie. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's obviously. Yeah. We'll see you next week, folks. Thanks for listening. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. EarTrumpetAudio.com Ideas and entertainment. Loud and clear.